So let's explore the difference between an observational study and a designed experiment a little bit more. So suppose you're interested in knowing how smoking affects lung capacity. Now study number one is you find 100 women age 20 who do not currently smoke and you randomly assign 50 of the 100 women to a smoking treatment and the other 50 to the no smoking treatment. Now those in the one group will smoke a pack a day for 10 years while those in another group will remain smoke free for 10 years. Now we all recognize that this is a terrible study first of all because it's completely unethical to force people to smoke a pack a day for 10 years and of course your ability to really force the other people to remain smoke free for 10 years is limited but let's just hypothetically say that these things are possible. Now study number two is you find 100 women age 30 of which 50 have been smoking a pack a day for 10 years while the other 50 have been smoke free for 10 years and you measure the lung capacity for each of the 100 women and then you analyze, interpret the results and draw a conclusion. To be fair they would measure the lung capacity for the 100 women after the 10 years on the first study as well. I should have put that in there, sorry. Alright, so now what is the explanatory variable and what is the response variable for both of these studies? Well, the explanatory variable is obviously smoking. You're trying to see whether smoking has an effect on lung capacity. So the response variable is your lung capacity, which um, I've done that kind of study, not with the smoking part, but they've, they um, have you take a deep breath and then you blow into a tube and then you can see how much lung capacity you have. So lung capacity is the response variable and then the thing that they're trying to influence or just observe is the smoking, right? Remember that the thing um, that you're trying to study is the response variable and the thing that you're manipulating, influencing to see whether that um, response variable changes is the explanatory variable. Often I find the response variable is actually easier to figure out first. What are they trying to look at? They want to see a change in what? In this case lung capacity and then what are they doing to see that change affecting smoking? So smoking is the explanatory response is the lung capacity. Now is the study an observational study or designed experiment? Well the first one, number one, where you're forcing people to smoke a pack a day for 10 years would be a designed experiment. It would be a highly unethical one, but nevertheless it would be a design experiment. As opposed to study number two was an observational study. So you're just asking people, hey, you've been smoking a pack a day for 10 years, let's have you blow into this tube and see what your lung capacity is at. In study number one, what would be considered the control group? Now a control group, remember, is the group that receives the nothing treatment, the no treatment, the baseline treatment. So to be the 50 people of the no smoking group, that's the control group. right? Remember, control is not everybody, it's only the people that get the baseline. So those people right there, they're the control group. So the 50 women in the no smoking group. Now which study would able, enable us to um, have a causal link? Now causal means cause and effect. But remember cause and effect can only happen with study number one because study number one is an experiment. Right? Cause and effect can only come out of experiments and even then not always. So because if you didn't account for every possible lurking variable there's still other things that could be affecting your designed experiment. Nevertheless in a designed experiment you're trying to con control for all of those different um, lurking variables and turn them into confounding variables that you actually accounted for. But the experiment allows for a causal link. Causal link, the other way, is cause and effect. Because the women were randomly selected and placed into the groups and assigned treatment. of smoking or not smoking. Now the advantages to that is that you could make a cause and effect, right? The researcher controls who goes into what, right? But <laughs> this would be highly unethical, right? No board, um, approval board in the world is going to let you do this study. So an approval board um, we'll talk more about later, but if you're going to experiment on humans, essentially you need to have an approval of a panel, um, usually a panel full of scientists and ethicists at um, whatever university or business you're working for. If you're going to go ex um, experiment on humans um, in the 1970s and 80s, all 
panels across um, the world, actually, but across the U.S. were established to basically make it so that you can't just randomly experiment on people in an unethical way. And a lot of that was the fallout of the Tuskegee um, syphilis studies, if you want to call them that. Um, we'll talk more about that in a later video. All right, so study number one was an experiment. That's the only way you're going to get a cause and effect is out of um, an experiment. And I just added that quick note that we just said earlier, that cause and effect can only be done, claimed with experiments, never with observational studies. It doesn't mean they're proven with experiments, but that you can, you can only even start to attempt them with experiments, never observational studies. That's the big advantage of a design experiment, is that you have um, student, people are placed into groups, the treatment versus, versus the control group, Right? And therefore, you can make claims about smoking causing lung capacity issues, but it would be highly unethical. All right, that leaves you with study number two, because you're never going to be able to do study number one because they won't let you. So what are some possible lurking variables in study number two? And I realize belatedly I did not give you enough space for this. I'm sorry. So I'll fix that for later so that there's more space. But basically, if women are deciding on their own to smoke a pack a day of cigarettes or not, then there are a variety of factors that might be affecting their lung capacity so um, and their smoking habits. Right? They, they might be doing other things as well, such as their health, their exercise level, their education level, um, economic factors um, do perhaps more poor people smoke a pack a day or perhaps more wealthy people smoke a pack a day because they can afford it, etc. Maybe genetics, maybe they're predisposed to um, certain types of behaviors and therefore predisposed to smaller lungs, who knows. There could be so much affecting what's going on here. Um, and that's a problem for us because um, the, we can't make that causal claim that we really want to. We want to say smoking causes lower lung capacity, but it's really hard to get at that without being unethical. So that's the big advantage to that observational study is that it's not unethical. You're just asking people what they're already about what they're already doing. You didn't force people to behave in a particular manner. They just record what people are already willingly doing. But the problem with that is, of course, that an observational cannot determine why the relationships are happening or what is causing something to happen. All you can determine is that there's relationships. There's some kind of association correlation, right? This is correlation is not causation. You can't prove causation without an experiment, but an experiment is really unethical to do. This is actually what the cigarette companies hid behind for, for decades, is they would say, well, we can't prove that smoking causes cancer because, of course, it would be unethical to do that kind of an experiment. Now, we all know at this point that smoking does, in fact, cause cancer, but to get there was very, very, very tricky um, because basically you can never really conduct a true experiment on people because that would be unethical. And that's why the purpose of both, or excuse me, that's why... Um, you would have to do an observational study here for the ethics, but it makes it really tricky to, to show the cause and effect relationships. Now, last but not least, let's remind ourselves of one little topic discussed in section 1.1, which is inferential. Inferential is when you take a study and you try to infer from that study about a larger group. So you look at a sample and you say, hey, I think the whole population is going to work like this. So the purposes of both of these studies is not really about these 100 women. You're not interested in just the 100 women selected, right? What you're interested in about is talking about those 100 women and what happened to them and inferring that all would, women would work like this, right? That this would be true for all women. By the way, why would they use just women? Well, that's actually a way to control a confounding variable of uh, gender. So if you use only people that identify as women, then you would not have to worry about gender being one of your confounding variables. Get it? So it, you turning gender from a lurking variable into a confounding variable. By only looking at women, you're removing the, the gender or biological sex, depending on how you wanted to ask the question of people. You'd be removing that from a lurking variable and turning it into a confounding variable, something that you actually accounted for in your study. So that's why with studies like this, they'll often look at just women or just men, right? because they want to eliminate biological sex as a, as a possibility for a lurking variable. 
but the key that makes it inferential is that you're trying to use this study, this small group, to talk about all women, right? So you're trying to inf or to make a a claim about how lung capacity effect is affected for all women. It's not just about those 100 women. It's about the, the larger group of all women. Therefore, it's inferential. And you can imagine a lot of what we do in statistics is actually inferential. We're not really interested in small groups. We're interested in what those small groups have to say about the larger populations. And of course, making that leap from small group to larger population is quite tricky. And that's what we'll work with in chapters 8, 9, 10, and beyond.